Petra Halls and weird other wonderful things. Uh, so the team itself was in the, in the vaccination programs, was an analytics team. I was really lucky the, the leader of that team had a background in spatial, so he wanted someone spatial to come in to help them, support them. There was, there was limited spatial going on at the time, so people had been seconded out, people were getting pushed left, right and centre in all sorts of different directions. So, so whilst there wasn't support to do the work, there was support around from people and they, they made sure they connected me up across with all these different people so I could get hold of the data at least, but yeah. And, and I came in sort of six months after, so they already at least had databases up and running, they had an R server going, they had some of this stuff, so I wasn't quite as fresh as some of the, the poor people at the start. Um, so when I left, I was like, well, what do I take with me? Lynn's luckily let me take my laptop. I used an MOH laptop, but I could easily access some of the bits and pieces of resources, and I had some styles, and I saved some computer scripts out. But in the end, not much of that was really used, because a lot of it was done in R or, or sort of on the fly, sort of QGIS mapping. So it was more about the knowledge. So, so the simple QGIS. So like right at the start, it was, it was a lot of really quick turnaround maps. Hey, you've got a day to make this, and in, in a week's time, we need a this at the end of some analytics, that sort of thing. So QGIS was great for that because it's real quick. You're just you're GUI based, you're quickly selecting, changing, and I'm really used to it, so that was easy. And slowly sort of adding these, these atlases, which is, I guess, a form of automation. So an atlas just grabs a, grabs a layer and steps through the individual features and uses that as the, the extent of, of the individual maps. And so there was definitely a need for DHBs that kept asking for DHBs, so it was perfect for that. And they just slowly built on this, iterating a little bit at a time when I got a chance. So adding an automated date, so I didn't accidentally forget it and it said it was made like two days ago. Um, doing a weird little script that grabbed the extent and decided what, what was the best orientation for the map and that could be fed into sort of data-driven mapping. And then I had a nice inverted polygon mask that would read the DHB and sort of um, similar to, to this one, we would gray out what wasn't the DHB so you wouldn't get confused about the data, it was just purely that DHB. Um, and, and more and more it's a consistent style, but that's great for these users, so they're not as used to maps, so the, the legends are very similar, they're used to knowing exactly where the title's gonna be, what's gonna show, even the color schemes and stuff like that, so it's getting more and more easier for them to read these maps. Uh, and I just wanted to stress that it was, it was often the team providing me with the data, I didn't have to go in and grab the data myself or do the analytics myself. So, so the simple R, so R is a statistical language, um, came out of Auckland University. Um, so the first thing to do was to learn R, so that was fun, but uh, I had a Python background, so it wasn't so hard, and, and it was quite linear compared to some of the Python stuff we'd been doing, which was good. And then to make the maps, I was using ggplot, which is designed to make uh, charts and graphs. So it does some weird and wonderful things. So I, I would want a, a map and just to be able to layer my titles and stuff on top, but a ggplot graph would be the graph, and it's used to forcing the title to be outside of it or the legend to be outside of it. So weird, weird ways to get your, sort of your head around that and using it for this other use. Um, but got better at it and slowly improved on it and made wonderful things. So the, often it would just grab the extent from the geom, but for the Auckland one, it didn't work because it would just be the two islands of a tiny bit of Auckland. So you'd say, no, the extent's going to be this, and now learn how to do insets, learn how to do tables added onto it, that sort of thing. But because it was an R, we could easily schedule it. We could create jobs, which is wonderful. Um, and when the server went down and killed all my jobs, I could easily run the script with a job to get it back up again, which was even better. Um, and, and uh, another guy came on board and he was making some really great modules to pull in the data. So less and less it was up to me to keep up to date with our views of the data. He was making these modules I could quickly grab back of, hey, can we grab a, a map of Northland for this age group or something like that? And there would be a module that I could pull it in and spit it out and throw it into um, R or QGIS. So, so my initial learnings was about being prepared. All these little tiny tweaks to maps and getting myself going, I was just building up a little toolkit so I could really quickly spit out maps when people asked for them, so it wasn't so hard. Um, um, the R side was definitely difficult. So this, this previous one, then the legend there where it's got the, the DHB line, that took me like a day to get that in the legend because it just wasn't, wasn't the way R wanted to make it because it's, it's wanted to make this, this graph and that's not what you do. Um, but once it's there, it was, it was quick and efficient. There was a, a series that went out like on a Monday, a national map, um, by a certain ethnicity, and towards the end of it, someone asked me, hey, can we grab this, but we're just interested in this other, other group, can we see what it looks like? They'll take you maybe a week or something. And it took me like uh, half a day at the most, not only to script it up, but to create the job, to push it out, to send it out, already going out via an email, you know? So it was just so easy just to change the query a little bit, change the title a little bit, and you're away. Um, and, and a big bit of it, I guess, was, was making 
spatial visible to people that they can get this sort of stuff, this sort of info. Like even when I first started just seeing it on a map, it was the first time people had seen these, these figures on a map before and got a feel for it. And so just, just letting them know what, what, what you can do. Um, and because of that, more and more work came in, which is great, so supporting the, the program, supporting it across. But then what that ended up doing was creating connections across the program. So I'd do something for someone over here, something for someone over there, and I'd see these, these links between areas and how what my team could do to support it. And that was good because at the start, they had a, um, I believe they had a meeting and all the, the heads of the areas would get together in one room at the start of the day and they'd be aware of what was going on. But slowly it got too big and they, they couldn't have that, so you'd lose, lose contact with the other areas of of the program and know what was going on, what they were interested in. And because we were the analytics and we're trying to feed info to them and information and do predictions for them, this is really powerful being able to understand what people are doing and see if we can help them or, or link them up. Like we've done a bit of vulnerability analysis over here. Maybe you guys in this outreach program, this would actually be really useful for you for these areas you're going to. So that was really powerful. Um, and I love that map over there. It's 1938, but to me it looks quite modern and fun. Um, so advanced QGIS, so I've gone beyond just bespoke quickly trying to get stuff out and using QGIS because I can do that to sort of more bespoke, more individual maps. So we had sort of um, lovely bivariate maps, we had travel time maps, had uh, these, these maps are showing data sharing agreements with overlapping areas so you can see where, what part of the country might be missing in this. Um, and then just slowly improving on the map itself. Like I would, for way too long, I would make a national map by hitting one button and then go back and make the, the um, the atlas to spit out all the DHBs, and then I just added a national geometry into the, the thing that was getting read. And, and the view of it changed as well. People were more interested in DHB regions as opposed to individual DHBs, that sort of thing. Um, my, my projects themselves were getting saved uh, into, into a network drive so other people could use them. So a lot of the people where I were had it little toyed with spatial in the background before, so they were interested in it but didn't have the time to do a whole lot. So being able to grab a QGIS project that's set up has the layers there and they can just rip out, rip out the SA2 layer, slap another one in, change the title and produce a map for sort of some exploratory analysis or something, it was really cool and saved me time. Um, and also creating uh, like a dummy project, a project with dummy data so I could easily share it. So I even shared that to, to the likes of Defence and stuff. Um, so that, that was cool. That, I think that was more because I was real proud of all the clever little things that Atlas was doing in the background. And then the advanced R use was all, all about the modules. So it was previously massive scripts producing stuff and to modularize it and to be able to reuse it. That's why that other example I gave was so quick, half a day, because it was just, now just go call this module. Now just go call this module, not rewrite this or rip out these parts. Um, so there's mapping modules that could take in a CSV or take in a data frame and say, I want to go major centers, I want to do DHBs, I want to do whatever. Um, there was ones for just exporting the spatial data, and that was so you could slap it into those QGIS projects and see it. Um, there was suppression modules, so that's always consistent. And so that's brilliant. So, so more and more modular, so inside of a repo, and a language that the analysts understood, so that more of them can use it and reuse that easily. So I don't have to do the work, they can go do the work. They can quickly make a map at the end of so a quick bit of analysis, see what it's like, explore something, this is nothing really going on here, okay, we'll buff that, try something else. Um, and then also building up um, a schedule tasks that, that also email out the maps, so they just go out on a Monday. There was uh, one lady I'd send out these maps to for a report every Monday, and at the end of when I left, she was like, oh, that was amazing, it just arrived every Monday. And my memory of it is that the, the R server constantly dying and restarting the jobs and all that sort of stuff, but from her perspective, it was, it was lovely and consistent and, and so, so easy, right? So even when I got it down to an easy level for QGIS, it would hit an R script to just spit it out, I grab that, dump it into QGIS, that would still take, you know, 30 minutes or something to go do, but this was just, it just happened, it was done. I didn't need to think about it. So other bits and pieces. A bit of AGOL, won't talk about the AGOL, but the side to it that was cool was pumping the data up to AGOL, and so that got all moved into, into R itself. So all of the, the sort of the process and grabbing the data together was already in R, and then that was getting spat out to, to spatial layers and pumped up. Instead it could just stay in there, it would run a, a virtual environment, with Python and R, spit it up into the cloud, into AGOL, it was awesome. And then when new data sets, they wanted to add in other ones or other tables, other columns, you could easily just modify that script, it was so cool. And just building up some data sets on the side. So the lovely splitting the chat because it was web Mercator, so instead of having a worldview like this, you got to see it together. 
um, a generalized DHB. So for one of the apps that they did with R Shiny, they had the little DHB in the corner, but the way it made it, it would save all the data. So you'd have this really fine detailed DHB saved to a tiny thing, taking up way more memory than it needed to to fit on a web page. And so spinning it out just as a little tiny micro version of it was really cool. I did little presentations. Um, the hierarchy one was because one of the analysts did a, 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 a little graph that was just like a, a, a vomit of colors, basically. <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe I could teach you something with this. And so we flipped it around and we had this lovely grade of colors so you could see the years and you could see, see trends and stuff more in the data. And so I thought that was a great chance to go talk to them about visual hierarchy, things that from Carto that can then be applied to their work. And, and my lead and myself also just talked about the work that we were doing to, to once again that get that spatial knowledge out there, what's possible, what, what are we doing, what are clever things are we doing out there. Um, so that was really cool. And we did a did up a nice confluence page, which was like a menu of maps, basically. They could go, oh, can I have one of those and one of those? Um, but it was also a really nice record of the work that we had done, because a lot of my work was mapping at the end of some analytics. So you could go through and you could see this really cool different things that were there. And hopefully in the future that means, because all these stuff's been saved to an R repo, if anything else happens, whoever's there at the time can then go through this and know that they can do this analysis or this analysis if they just go into the repo and try and find it. Um, so my further learnings and enable others to allow more to happen. So, and people are really interested in maps and wanting to do spatial. Everyone had played around a little bit in the background. So giving them modules, giving them future projects just made my life easy. Um, needing to constantly get spatial out there. People just unaware what you could do or if it was easy to do this thing or hard to do this thing. Just just getting that information out there for people, making it easy. And definitely listening to users. So that one there was a bivariate map and I thought, I thought I'd be really clever and give them population counts and percentages so they could really understand what was going on. And it was just too confusing. They're like, oh, we don't, we don't want this. Instead, can you give us 190 maps? I was like, oh, you can give you 190 maps. That's what you want. I'm sure later on they'll come back and go, oh, maybe this, maybe you could do this thing called a bivariate. And I was like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. But, um, and, and other times, just really good ones that are one with uh, sort of an EWI group where um, giving them a chloropress map was just too hard to understand. They just wanted a point with a value over the area with, a, with an exact count sort of thing, you know? Just make it really easy for them to understand. So, so by the end, I'm making these lovely informative maps to support analysis and operations and supporting others. So I guess the informative side's the interesting part. So before it, it would be, be tables and a report and you can drill into it and kind of see it but just really quickly being able to see it on the map turns it like into information rather than just data. Really quickly engaging and interesting. Um, and supporting this, this analysis side, but also ops side, so people going in outreach and stuff, putting it out there. And sometimes it would just be confirming what they already knew, so wanting to get what's, what does uptake in these particular cohorts look like in this area, being able to feed it to them in a map, and they'd be like, yeah, that's, that's what we got the feeling was, that it was these ones who were lagging and not these ones, so this is where we need to target. So, so my lovely summary, people love maps. I could probably just end there, it would be good. good. Um, but it was just so easy, even just to start slapping a map into a report made people take notice of the port way more. But then you can also make an informative, as I've talked about, you can, way more engaging, um, getting this back and forth with our team was great. Uh, using a variety of tools, don't be scared to try other things. I hadn't touched the R and that ggplot was definitely painful at times, but it was awesome once you got the hang of it, you know, and yeah. you learnt what not to try and do, and um, me wanting to do my, my spade on the, on the coastlines, learning just don't do that in ggplot, it's not built for that, stick to what it does. Um, and, and the likes of the QGIS, which is just that bespoke, quickly playing around with new stuff in there, as ways of testing will people use this or not, don't go coded up in R, which may take ages, instead just quickly get ideas out there. Uh, this, this iterate idea, like I didn't start with these amazing projects, it was just bit by bit building onto these things. Automate, absolutely automate. Like, so this was automating ways I grabbed the data, automating ways I flushed out maps, automating just all sorts of bits and pieces. Just make your life easy. Um, definitely enable others so you can do more. Um, and the, the one that I, was real interesting was that maps creating connections between the teams, people wanting it, forming those connections, forming those, those links with other teams, and, and the back and forth nature of that. So one of my guys is doing some analysis, maybe vulnerability, I'm not sure. Um, and he wanted someone to go out to, like who, who would be interested in this? And straight away I knew one of the guys doing outreach was like, ah, oh, I reckon he'd be the one to hit. We couldn't get hold of him for ages. It ended up being a call while he was getting off a plane, but that's fine, that's what we did. Um, but he really loved it and found it really useful, you know?
and definitely continued the highlight space. You're just, I'd feel like I'd gotten the message through to people, but constantly people would be like, oh no, you can't do that. Like, yeah, we can, we can absolutely easily give you a map of what, that's not a problem or whatever. You know, just this need to constantly remind people of what's, what's the possibilities, what's the potential. Um, yeah, and I do have one, one final plug, um, probably a bit, bit more propaganda than anything, but um, definitely vote for the tiny tree potato. It's well worth it. Um, well that's me. Uh, yeah. Did you relocate to Chatham? Did I relocate to Chatham? 